most people view God as so focused in the running of the universe and the governing of nations that he can't possibly be interested in the micro details of my life. But the truth is that God is committed to reframing your life and leading you and working in you just as he works in the details of the universe. In fact, Jeremiah the prophet said, you need to vision God, you need to see God as the grand potter who's making a jar, a vessel for his glory. So God is involved in the details of my life. Let me say it again. Most of you have an easy time picturing God controlling the destiny and outcome of the universe. But you haven't yet realized that God is as committed to a work that he is doing in you as he is doing a work around you. And I can prove it to you. In fact, the verse is on the screen in front of you. It's in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 13. I want you to read it with me, and I want you to read it prayerfully and thoughtfully. Listen to what Paul told the church at Philippi. Just before we read it, let me remind you that he just said to them, just like you've always obeyed when I'm around, now you should obey when I'm not around. For it is God who works in you. He says, God is working uh, around you and now he's working in you. So you be obedient. So watch this. Read this with me, please. But it is God Watch that verse carefully. Understand what Paul is saying. The God who created the world by the power of his word, the God who created the stars in the sky, the God who formed the Rocky Mountains, it's the very same God who at this moment is working in your soul, preparing you for the power of his grace. He's amending, regulating, and fine-tuning the inner workings of your soul so that you may prosper in his grace. I get excited in watching the news as it feels very much to me that God's plan is unfolding for the world just as he said it would. If you read your Bible, you'll be shocked how accurate the prophecies of scriptures are concerning the destiny of the world. But I get even more excited when I stand on this platform on Sunday morning and look God's people in the face and remind them God is doing a work also in your heart. He is reframing, reshaping your life into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So this text says the way you know that God is working in you is that you have a desire to know him. You have a desire to please him and honor him. You long to know more about him and you long to learn more of his word. You see that in the text? It is God who works in you both to will or to desire. So no man or woman can know God except that God has first given them that desire. How do I know God is at work in the world? Because when I work in this church and I work outside of this church and strike up a conversation with them about spiritual matters, they have a hunger to know God. They have a desire to learn more of the truth. Their ears perk up. How do I know God is working in the world? Because there is a desire in the human heart to know God, to learn more of his truth. So every propensity we have to seek God has come from God himself. Whenever I long to pray, that is God at work in my heart. Watch this carefully, though. He says, how do you know God is working in you? You have a desire to know him. But the second thing is, he says, you don't just have a desire. Watch this carefully. Desire alone does not add up to the work of God thereby impugning much of the evangelical church. Because much of the evangelical church is full of a desire to put on a big show. This text says, you have to work it out. You have to take it from desire to responsibility, to action. You watched that this morning in our guest soloist. She, she told you about the desire God put in her heart, and now she's transformed it into songs telling about the grace that God has worked in her heart. That's the idea. The word is the word for energy. Where do you put your energy? If 99% of your energy is spent on yourself, you can't possibly be responding to the work of God. 
Because God's work is to put in a, in a, a desire in our hearts and give us the competency to, to, to work it out in our daily lives. Let me just reduce it to simple terms for you so you don't miss what I'm trying to say. If you are not serving God with passion, you are somehow suppressing the work of God in your life. This text says it. Look, what are we working for? His good pleasure, not our own. It's not what I want. It's what pleases God. What is in the heart of Christ? It's to please the Father. Then that too will be in my heart. God says, how do I know that... That I, uh, how do I know that God is working in my heart? I have a desire, and I put it into practice. Don't miss this. There will be many times that you fail in your attempt to put it into practice, but God designed it that way. Following Christ takes practice in your daily life. You often trip along the way, but that's not the point. The point is, I have a desire to know God, and I've taken it beyond desire to put it into practice. Now, if you don't mind, I'm confessing right up front this morning, this is a topical message. This is not an expositional message. These are some of the things that I have learned in my journey with Christ that he's taught me how to know that he is at work in my heart. If God says, I'm at work in your life, what does it look like? What is he going to be focused on in developing in my life. I have a few things that I want to show to you. Would you write them down first of all? How do I know God is working in my heart? Because God is working to prove my faith. That's one of the great things that God will be preoccupied, if you don't mind me saying, in the development of your life. He will prove your faith. Mark down James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into various kinds of trials, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. And let patience have her perfect work, so that you may be perfect and mature, lacking in nothing. So God says, the way that your faith grows is through hardship. I wish it wasn't so. I wish it was through pleasure. I through, wish it was through success. But God says, you know full well, we would not get it. We would not understand God if our hearts are not first broken. It's through losses. It's through trials. It's through pain that our faith is proven. Watch this now. You need to understand carefully. Hang in there with me, church family. Watch this carefully. God is not the least bit interested in testing your faith so that you will fail. That is not his heart. He wants to prove to you the worth and value and strength of your faith. Not faith in faith, but faith in Jesus and faith in God. You hear what I'm saying? God does not put obstacles in your way so that you will trip. He puts obstacles in your way so that you will learn how to climb over them by faith in him. It's really an ingenious plan. God says, you would not otherwise know me, desire me, or walk with me. If I pave your way with success, you will become self-absorbed and you will lose your way. And the only way you will ever be able to snuggle up to the heart of God is through the fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. It is by leaning hard upon the bloody cross that God's people get a glimpse into the glory of our heavenly Father. And so he says, I'm going to I have to prove your faith. So he does that. Listen, David was part of receiving the offerings that Solomon was going to use to build the temple. And he prayed this magnificent prayer in 1 Chronicles 29. And he said to God, I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. God's longing, God's desire, God's plan is to test my heart to bring the uprightness of his work out in my life. It's not only God who should test your heart. You know, you're supposed to test your own heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 says, examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. Don't just ride on your mom's and dad's coattails or the fact that you were raised in the church. Examine yourself and make sure that you have exercised faith in Jesus Christ alone so that you belong to God. So we examine ourselves. 
I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment so I won't go too far afoot. But it doesn't take me very long to look at my heart and say, I, got a long way, I have a long way to go, I think. So you understand that God needs to prove your faith so that you uh, will know the worth and value and power of faith in your heart. I'll go uh, just on a brief sidebar, just a quick bunny trail to tell you that the Bible speaks specifically about the selection of leaders in the local church, and it says, don't you dare choose them until they've first been tested. Don't put someone in spiritual leadership until they have been tested. You don't put people in spiritual leadership because they're popular in the church, because they have money in the church, or because they've been successful in business in the world. You watch them to see if they know how to shepherd souls and care for people and guard over people's lives. Paul said about deacons, don't hire a deacon until they've first been tested. See, the Bible talks a lot about testing. So James says that the testing will come via suffering and trials and troubles. Another sure way, in fact, I think it's one of the most effective ways that God proves your faith is through criticism from others. Numbers 21 and 1 Samuel chapter 30 speak of both Moses and David falling under the criticism of God's people, even to the point of wanting to stone the old boys. I've thought to myself, I've been criticized many times. Never have I had anyone pick up a rock to stone me and put me to death. But criticism is a sure way for God to show you what's really in your heart because you whine and wallow and complain that someone would dare offend you. And if you don't get over your offense, you'll never be able to grow spiritually. Do you know how many people are offended in the church? Do you know how much energy it takes to stay mad at others because someone said a wrong word about you 15 years ago? You're destroying your spiritual life. You're destroying your spiritual life. Get over yourself. Get over yourself and move on. God's proving your faith. Now, I sound bold and brave, don't I? I assure you, I react just like you do. I can spend days and weeks wallowing in self-pity because someone didn't like the way I did whatever. God says, I want to, pr- I want to show you just how self-absorbed you can be so that you can build your faith. And so God, God do you understand what I'm saying, church family? God is working in the world today, and he's taking your heart like a piece of clay, and he's massaging it to pull out the weeds and plant true faithfulness in your heart. I think that's an amazing thing. When I get to preach to you on Sunday morning, I realize they're not listening just to the voice of a preacher. God himself is meddling around in the affairs of your life when you are brave enough to listen to the word of God because he loves you. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let me show you number two. God works to fill you with his power. You know why I think that's important? Because your faith will never stand without the power of God. And when God decides to test you and try you, you will crumble, except God says, I will test you and I will give you all the strength of my spirit behind that testing so that you'll be able to bear up underneath that struggle. Church family, listen to what I'm saying to you this morning. There is no trial that you will have to face that God will not give you every bit of energy that you need to do what he's called you to do. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Write down, will you, Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul is praying for the ancient church at Colossae, and he says, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance. Did you hear that? All endurance and patience with joy. Paul said it to the church at Ephesus. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So there is no weapon formed against you that will ever be able to silence you and crush you and ultimately defeat you. I know this sounds bold, but it's true. A Christian who kneels before God to receive the strength of his spirit is invincible. You are invincible. If you keep yourself connected to the source of power. What is the source of power? It's the Holy Spirit. I preached it to you after Easter. 
Jesus said, go back to the city and wait for the promise of my Father. And when he's come, you're going to have the power of God, the very power of God available in your daily life. What this means practically is that the doctor has just told you there's a mass in the center of your chest. You don't remember much else except there has been this wave of frightening emotion after emotion coming behind it. You walk out of the doctor's. It happens in this church every week. You walk out of the doctor's office stunned, afraid, worried. Then you hear this quiet voice in the back of your conscience saying, I will give you all power to make it across the finish line if you just cling to me. You lean upon me. I've watched way too many of you, way too many of you, place your loved ones in a box and slide them into their final resting place in the ground. I've watched way too many of you. But if I may say I've watched with joy when I realized that even in the face of death, God's very people experience the strength of his own heart And by and by, they rise up with wings like eagles, and they begin to soar under God. So some of you have been through the terrible experience of someone you've loved. You've been devoted to them, and you find out that they've been unfaithful. You're crushed beyond description. You've lost your way as a result of it. You're confused about how to go on. I'm telling you, God himself can be your strength. He will give you the might to get your feet back underneath you and follow him faithfully the rest of the days of your life. That's the strength of God. He's going to test you, and he's going to give you all the strength that you will ever need to be faithful. And number three, God works in you to keep you holy. He made you holy through Christ. And he's going to keep you holy. Mark down, will you, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 16. You shall be holy, for I am holy. The odd thing about that word holy is that as soon as you mention it, a bunch of weird thoughts start entering God's, the minds of God's people. They don't understand. Do you know what holiness simply means? It's in its, in its uh, um, simplest form, it means separate. It means that of all the people on the planet, God has chosen you to represent his heart in the world. So you come into a crowded room of people who are abuzz with their own selfish desires, working out their agenda. They never see beyond the end of their nose. They don't think about others. They don't care about others. They don't serve others. But then there's God's people. There's a woman who doesn't seem to be interested in making herself look better in the face of all of her friends. She's concerned about serving other people. That's holiness. Holiness means you do not fit the mold of the world. Your life is representing the mold of Jesus Christ. This isn't a traditional definition of holiness, but I think it's biblical. Holiness is not measured by what you give up, but by what you take up in your life. It's not what I don't do, it's what I do for the glory of God. I give up the selfish motives of my own heart. I give up the hatred of my own heart so that I might somehow be a vessel for God's love and God's grace to a hurting world. That's holiness. God says, I'm not going to rest until every air of your life has been transformed into the holiness of Jesus Christ. He's so determined. There are times when I say to God, would you just give me a pass for a week where we can let this thing lie? And you know what God says? Not on your life. My single greatest commitment in you is to conform you to the image of my son until you act like him in every circumstance. I will not let up. I will not give up. I'm going to keep working on you. I have a ways to go, don't you think? Be careful, because so do you. We all do. But it's an exciting journey where God shows me the darkness and stubbornness and selfishness of my own heart, and he says, there's a better way. There's a more beautiful way. You can respond as Jesus would respond in any given circumstance. I've told you this before. I sin once a day on Eglinton Avenue. (laughs) 
I'm not proud of it. I'm wrestling with God over it. This past week, I was driving home, and I called somebody the same name I always call them when they cut me off. <laughs> but now, it gets halfway across my lips, and I say, stop it, man. You're speaking about a human being made in the image of your God. Stop it. Don't disrespect people in any circumstance, even when you think they are a fathead. <laughs> I rear-ended a guy the other day. I felt so stupid. Uh, I was late for an appointment in Cambridge, coming off the 401 down near Holiday Inn Drive, and I thought the line of traffic moved along, and lo and behold, it didn't, so I floored it, and kaboom! <laughs> and I looked up and thought, oh, man, it's all my fault, and it was all my fault. I jumped out and profusely began to apologize to this kind gentleman. I found out he's one of the uh, upper uh, leaders of, of the upper echelon of Loblaws. Hispanic guy. So I quickly told him I was a pastor, hoping that would earn me some favor. <laughs> I did. I did. I told him, I'm a pastor. I'm so sorry. It's all my fault. You know what struck me? I expected him, because this is what happens most of the time, I expected him to jump out of the car and take my head off in anger. He was more patient than most Christians I've ever known. And I told him so. I asked for his email address and his cell phone number. And I wrote him a note and said, I don't know if you are a follower of Jesus, but you sure acted like it the day that I bumped you from behind. Thank you for being so kind. That's holiness. Holiness is when we act like Jesus and less like the stubborn sinners that we we, also, we are all so often. One of the single most frightening realities for me as a pastor of 32 years now is the growing decline of an understanding of the true holiness of God. And Max, where did Max go? I was going to, he left. There he is in the back. I was thinking while we were worshiping, one of the things that I love about this man is that I know when he leads worship, it is not to show off, but it is to lead us in the true worship. As we sang together this morning, I was lifted right off my, the floor. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And God's determined to make you, to keep you holy. And let me show you. Uh, fourthly, God is working to keep you balanced. God works to keep you balanced. I would say that this lesson is probably one of the most important lessons that uh, I've had to learn through the years because I think that individual human beings have such a propensity to extremism in any number of ways that God knows he has to keep you balanced. Do you know what a balanced life is? It's one filled with the sound teaching of God's word, but it's not just a head stuffed with Bible verses. It's a heart that is balanced out with wisdom. It knows what God's word says, and it knows how to apply it to each situation. I know that. Just mark this down, 2 Timothy 1.13. Paul said to Timothy, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. Sound teaching means that we understand how to live our lives in a balanced, wholesome, stabilized way. It's so important because we have a propensity to run to the extremes in our spiritual lives. And in my view, the extremes that I see in the church are nominal Christians and nut job Christians. Nominal Christians are those who say they believe the Bible, but never speak of it, ever. It is not real in their lives. The wacko spirituality are those people who are so heavenly-minded, they're no earthly good, as D.L. Moody used to say. A person who is so heavenly-minded, they're no earthly good, turn every conversation to a Bible verse. Now, you're going to be upset with me. You know your pastor's heart, and my commitment to the Scriptures is unequivocal. But if you take your Bible verse by verse and simply beat people over the head, you have no wisdom and it is no representation of Christianity. Christianity is knowing how to take the sound teaching of the Bible and translate it into wholesome living. 
So I was exposed early on to a Christianity that said you can't go to the high school dance, and if you do, you're damned. Baptists don't dance. I regret to this day when I go to to weddings in our church and people ask me to dance, and I say, I'm sorry, I don't know how. (laughs) It's true, I have no rhythm. The only dance I can perform is with my wife alone in our living room, and I do it once in a while. You don't want to watch me dance. But for goodness sakes, I remember being shocked when I discovered that David danced before the Lord. And I felt cheated. (laughs) I remember learning as a new Christian that we couldn't go to the movies, Kalita. Can you believe that? We weren't allowed to go to the... It was worldly. The worldliness of the self-righteous people in the church was the only thing greater in my view. And I started to learn that's not a wholesome interpretation of Scripture. We were told continually that we were not to, we were not to fit in with the ways of the world. And there's a, there's a strong place for the believer not simply imbibing the ways of the world without the wisdom of God. You've got to understand my heart. It means that God has made me three parts. I'm spirit, soul, and body. And God wants me to have great enjoyment in the experiences of of this life. One of my staff told me that they went to Star Wars last night. And I said, how'd you enjoy it? They loved it. I said, I thought it was a flop. I remember the first time I snuck to a drive-in with a friend. The drive-in theater. I slumped down in the seat. I was sure my pastor was watching me. (laughs) You talk about confusing guilt You've already heard me say that God is determined to protect a spirit of holiness in your life. But the great danger is that you take holiness to an extreme that God never intended. Do you know how you know you're taking true biblical spirituality too far? You don't know how to laugh. The more you know how to laugh, the more likely you are linked to the heart of Jesus. The more you're able to talk to people without feeling that you must convert them in every conversation, don't get me wrong, you know this is an evangelical church. Our our responsibility before God is to preach the gospel to every creature, but it is also to respect individuals with a mind to hear and make up their own mind about the future. And so I reposted an article recently that ticked off some of my friends. It was written by a democratic Christian woman in the United States that I said, I am a Christian, but I'm not all that. Some of the mindsets that unbelievers have about us is our fault. Because frankly, some of us are just plain weird. (laughs) Because we take spirituality. Listen to me. Spirituality is the single greatest force in your life. It is. It is the essence of who you are, but it must be held by the wisdom of God or it will destroy. You've got to keep the boundaries set up in your life the way that God planned them to in your life. You've got to be balanced in your theology. I know this more than you do because I preach every Sunday. Jesus Christ came, the Bible says, with grace and truth. Some churches are all about just truth. They have no grace. That's not Christianity. Other churches have just grace and no truth. That's not Christianity. There must be a perfect balance. It's hard to be balanced. I grew up in a CN, Canadian National Railway family. My grandpa was a conductor, an engineer. All my uncles worked for the Canadian National Railway. And I remember as a boy trying to walk down uh, uh, those train tracks. It was extremely hard to keep balanced. And that's exactly what God wants in your spiritual life, is for you to stay balanced, or you will become ineffective. Keep balanced in your lifestyle. If you work 60 and 80 hours a week, you're not balanced. You're destroying your soul and destroying your wife's soul and your family's soul. You have to know how to rest. You have to know how to take a break. And you need to be balanced in your life. Let me show you fifthly and lastly, God works to keep you growing it's one of my favorite themes of the Christian life. It's based in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18, where 
My first pastor took me to this text, challenged me to memorize this verse, and it's been a theme that has run throughout my entire journey, and it is. As long as I walk on this earth, I want to keep growing and learning and changing. That's why 1 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you've stopped learning, you've stopped growing, and you've stopped worshiping. You should be asking for the good book and other good books till the day you die. As long as you have eyes to see and a mind to receive, you should keep growing and learning and ask God what he's trying to tell you. This church is the sum total of all the work that God is doing in each of our hearts, and we all have a story to tell. The question is, do you know what God is working in your life right now? What is the lesson that he is pressing in your heart? What are the values he's trying to instill in you? Can, you? can you articulate them to other people? That's what it means to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me conclude by just reminding you that when Paul came to the church of Thessalonica, he said to them, you surprised us because when we showed up, you listened to us, preached the word of God, and you received it as it is, in fact, the word of God. Then he makes this little statement, which is at work in those of you who believe. You can never know God working in your heart without a close relationship to this book, the Bible. Reading it, studying it, and digesting it for yourself is the way that God will speak the light of his love and grace in your heart. Let me lead you in prayer as we finish. After I pray, Kalita will sing such an appropriate song. Listen to the words and make them the prayer of your heart. Father, we stand amazed at your work in the universe. For the earth and all that is exists because of the power that you have. But wonder of wonders to me is that you are fine-tuning the intricate details of my soul and our souls so that we can prosper in your grace. I pray that your people would grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.